Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the NFL Weekly Preview Podcast right here on Roto Grinders. Justin Carlucci here alongside a TJ Lasig. What's going on, my man? How are you? We are in the home stretch here officially. One week remaining. Went by fast. It was a crazy season. People in and out, different weeks, all kinds of late breaking news, whether it was sometimes related to COVID, sometimes not. Definitely a, a, an NFL DFS season to remember. So we'll, uh, we're going to try to break down for you guys here some of the, the scenarios going into Week 17. I think Week 17 always brings a unique beast because there will be certain games that matter, certain games that don't matter, certain teams that have something to play for, a lot of teams that have nothing to play for. So we don't have the most information right now, just recording this on Monday in terms of officially, will there be teams that are sitting guys or things like that? But but what we can do is talk through a little bit of what does the playoff picture look like? What are the teams that are that are still out there battling and, and give some early thoughts on, on which of the games we want to target as a result? Sounds like a plan. This will be our last preview podcast of the season. And yeah, it went fast, so... Thank you all for listening. Thanks for your feedback, following us. Hope what we did was useful and try to give you a broad overview and just some preparation for the following week. Don't worry. There's a ton of playoff NFL content on Roto Grinders. A lot of good analysts giving you a lot of good stuff. There's going to be a ton of showdowns I'm positive of, which really just exploded onto the scene the last you know year, year and a half, whatever it's been. So a lot of nice little slates the first couple of weeks, and there will be showdowns. And, of course, uh, these other major sports, such as NBA, are in full swing, too. So a lot going on. It's been fun. And, uh, you know, TJ and I will be popping around on various shows and, and, artic- and doing various articles throughout the uh, other seasons here. So you can check us out. TJ, what is your Twitter handle just for the people? We'll, we'll drop it in the beginning here instead of the end so people can. I like it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the Twitter handle is at TJL5124DFS. So find me there on Twitter. Give me a follow. It's been it's been a good time doing this show with you. It's, uh, it, definitely enjoyed it. Always good to, to talk about the previous week, do a bit of a early look at the, the future week. So it was a good time. And like Justin said, hopefully you guys have – Enjoyed the show. Yeah, it's been great. Uh, look me up at the J Carlucci. Feel free to hit me up anytime. And in terms of Roto Grander stuff, I'll try to point you in the right direction. And, and we, we stress it time after time. Our premium products are our top of the line. Ownership projections, lineup HQ is so user friendly and, and plenty of ways to build uh, to really get you to the top of those leaderboards. Premium discord chat, you know, a million different reasons. Premium shows. It's awesome stuff. Awesome stuff. Love the team at Roto Grinders. Hope everyone is having a great holiday season as well. And, you know, for me as a commissioner of a league where I, you know, it's kind of like the league, the show. I feel like a lot of hometown friends and uh, a couple of uh, like a melting pot of a couple other people here or there, but we really banter. And what a headache for me it was to just babysit and manage the season with COVID and we couldn't find a venue. We usually drafted the same venue. You know, if you heard some of our pods from months ago, I was just like, it was a headache for me. And I'm glad the season's over. But a real, real gut punch for me as I'm going to finish fourth in my big auction annual league and I'm going to win damn total points. I lobby with my friends every year to pay more to total points because that's the best team, especially in a 16 team league. And uh, I'm the commissioner. I might as well just do it next year, right? Do it, do it or get out, right? But what are you going to do, man? So I'm the, I'm the third loser in my league, but I got total points, man. You got any annual league sad stories for me? I had a tough, tough season-long league this year. I do, I do three-keeper leagues. So I'm in, I'm in more of a rebuilding phase, I would say. I didn't make the playoffs, but, but just – no, no, no championship sweats for me this this past weekend. But what are you going to do? Got to go. Got to rebuild for the future. Get some of those keepers and, and come back strong next week or next year, I should say. 
I can't tell if you're if you're talking about your fantasy team or the Eagles, right? Because uh, an abrupt similar spots. <laughs> and now you get to hear Philly Sports Talk Radio with Hurt, Hertz versus Wentz for the next what seven months? Isn't that exciting? Are you ready for that to hear the quarterback drama? Oh, there's going to be nonstop drama. I'm sure. I know that. Peterson already came out, said Hertz is starting in week 17. Obviously, no surprise there. But turns out that maybe there's there's some more issues in the, the Philadelphia Eagles football team than there is with just Carson Wentz because they just lost to Dallas. And uh, it's just ugly. It's an ugly scene. I guess that, that can transition us a bit here into the, the NFC playoff picture. So I guess first reminder for everyone – because I, I kind of forgot this myself, is that seven teams in each conference are going to make the playoffs this year. So used to be six each, so now there's 14 total teams. The top team in each conference will get the bye. Uh, so in the NFC right now, the way things are looking, that there's nine teams that are still alive fighting for those seven spots. At the top, you've got the Packers, the Saints, and the Seahawks. All three of these teams have clinched their divisions, but they all still have something to play for because they all have a shot at the number one seed, which is, of course, very important because it gets them the bye. So all three of those teams will have something to play for, and I believe they are all 425 games. So they'll be happening simultaneously. Then after that in the NFC, you've got Tampa, who's locked into a playoff spot but still needs to – to win because that will give them the highest wild card seed, which we talked about before the show is a, is a nice spot because then you get to play the winner of the, the dreadful NFC East. So Tampa's got something to play for there. And then you've got three teams battling for the last two wild card spots, which is the Rams, the Cardinals and the bears and the Rams and the Cardinals play against each other. So I believe how it works is that whoever wins that game will be in. And then also if the Bears win, they're in. So basically all three of those teams are kind of in a in a win and in environment. And then, and then you have the NFC East where, where Washington, Dallas, and the Giants could all potentially get that, that division title and, and the, I guess, fourth seed in the playoffs, despite not deserving the fourth seed at all, in my opinion. Yeah, quite a log jam there. So it's going to be a very interesting Sunday, and you want to target the studs with the ceilings that are in meaningful games. So those games that TJ just rattled off are, are some of what you want to shift your focus to. And I tell you what, though, we don't really have any news on guys sitting, and we could touch on later in the pod some teams that might sit some players, but – you can really most likely leave some money on the table because I'm sure there'll be some three and four K guys, you know, larger field GPPs where you can get seriously unique. Some of these guys are going to get, you know, 50, 60 snaps that are, you know, 4k, something like that. I don't even want to begin digging into them because we really can't right now until we get word on, on what's happening. But in terms of jockeying for position and competing for, uh, you know, home field advantage, and just all these teams trying to get in. There are enough teams where you will have a decent player pool to try to analyze what's going on. And one thing that is a little more cut and dry is the NFC wildcard picture. The Rams play the Cardinals, and whoever wins that game is in, correct? Correct. But the other situation there is Chicago who, if they win, will leapfrog either the Rams or the Cardinals, who will lose. So, what a year for Chicago. Mitchell gets benched, laughing stock of the league, the Bears, well, you know. Nick Foles, I like Nick Foles, good guy, played poorly, got hurt. Here comes Trubisky again, bringing the Bears back, who are – contending for a playoff seed and Trubisky and the bears have been pretty popular tournament targets lately. David Montgomery's been good. Alan Robinson. We know how good he's been. 
and Mitchell Trubisky has been a little more than serviceable, I guess I would say. And, and here we are. That Rams Cardinals game, you noticed right away, very low total. And we're trying to put the pieces together there. Jared Goff just saw an Adam Schefter tweet. He's going to see a doctor. He will need thumb surgery at some point. Don't know if he's going to get it. His status as of Monday afternoon here is uncertain for this coming week. Kyler Murray is also hurt. His status is also uncertain. So, where does that leave you, TJ? Anywhere? Yeah, I I can't figure out what's going on with that that Cardinals Rams game. Now I'm looking on DK Sportsbook and I don't even see it on the board. So maybe what I am seeing on Vegas Insider isn't correct because it says a 39 and a half point total, which really doesn't make any sense. That's super super low. But yeah, and, and like you just mentioned, Goff and, and Kyler Murray are both in potential game time decision type of of scenarios there. So I think we need to take a wait and see approach with that game. But if it does come Sunday and everyone's fully healthy, that that seems like a good game to target just because again, we want these spots where you have teams that have something to play for and that are going to be using their studs and their best players. And and those are obviously going to be the people that have the, the highest ceilings in general in this slate. So We'll want to keep an eye on that Arizona LA spot. And then the other one that you mentioned, Green Bay Chicago. I think that that sets up nicely because you have, again, two two teams that have something to play for. Green Bay is playing for that number one seed in the bye, which is critical. The Bears are playing to get into the playoffs. So and and you've got some pretty obvious targets there, right? You've got Devonta Adams and Aaron Rodgers. You've got David Montgomery, who, like you said, just continues to be a beast. He had a solid game yesterday and and ran really poorly to get that, too. He ended up with 95 yards, five five yards short of the bonus, and got vultured by the backup running back on on a touchdown. I think Mitch ran in a touchdown, too. So I think he still put up 20 points, and it easily could have been another 30-point game for Montgomery. So I think – and uh, what about Aaron Jones? get hurt like what's his guy hurt he came back he stepped He's out of good. bounds on a long run good. that should have been called back made me mad but that's okay yes, he did AJ yeah, Dillon so he's all good AJ Dillon showed a glimpse of the future man AJ Dillon looked pretty good I mean in that offense I'm sure you know I could probably lace him up and get a couple yards you know if I find the right <laughs> hole but Dillon did look good and you know they never the thing is, Aaron Jones still didn't. Did Aaron Jones sign? He's he still didn't sign an extension, right? So there you go. AJ Dillon look pretty good for the future there if they don't bring Aaron Jones back. But yeah, good point. Yeah. Trubisky still fifty six hundred. You know, twenty four DKP, not bad. Yeah, I think you can go there. And the the other team that that we mentioned in the NFC. Uh, or two of the other teams, I should say, are, are the Saints and the Seahawks. So, again, similar to Green Bay, they're competing for that number one seed. So we've, we've got Kamara back up to 9,500 after his near 60-point performance. So no, no more $7,600 Kamara, but he's up at 9,500, probably one of the, the better raw plays on the slate. So we'll, we'll, we'll want to look there. And then in Seattle, of course, you've got all the – the Russ Wilson options, although they've been mediocre at, at best as of late. So I think right off the bat, like Kamara, Devontae Adams, probably the two best role plays on the slate, just given the fact that, that they are who they are and their teams are are in spots where they're going to need to to play and compete. So th- those are two guys that, that we will likely end up looking to as cash game building blocks, if I had to guess. Yeah, and I'm just looking at that running back position. It's it's interesting. And I don't think salary will be a problem by the time Sunday rolls around, most likely. But, yeah, you got the two guys up top. And then Dalvin Cook at Detroit. And we have 
four, three 9K backs and then David Montgomery. Henry, we'll get to the Titan situation a little later, but obviously that's, that's a meaningful game as well. Um, but Montgomery's still chilling there at 77, you know? Big yeah, game. that's a nice price. Did you ever think you'd be saying that? 77 is a great right? for Montgomery. I know. It's it's crazy, but I it, it I think he was that's what he was this past week, right? Yeah, he didn't do he didn't do anything bad. I'll tell no. you that much. He didn't do anything to to deserve a a, a price staying the same or a price decrease. So I, I think I think Montgomery is someone that I'm going to be definitely interested in again, is especially because like you said, there's going to be some value that opens up somewhere, mm-hmm. right? So that's why my, my guess as of this time is that it's going to become a very stars and scrubs type of build where you're going to want to get in the the Kamaras, the Devontae Adams, the Montgomery, the Derrick Henry, jam in some of the the biggest studs. We'll, we'll, we'll probably touch on the Chiefs in a bit, but the Chiefs have locked up the AFC number one seed. So we could see them either resting guys or I know Tyreek Hill's already banged up. So we're, again, we're not going to want to pay up for the expensive Chiefs guys, if there's any risk that they don't play a full complement of snaps. I tell you what, it's gonna feel like a preseason slate. That's really what it's gonna. That's really what it's gonna be like by the time Sunday rolls around. But you make a good point. And, and it's not often we get 15 games, right? Like yeah. every the only there's a what the, the Eagle Eagles Washington is the Sunday night game, but all the other teams are playing on the Sunday main slate. So. Biggest biggest main slate of the year. Yeah, and the other game you mentioned, which I'm very much interested in, is Tampa Bay and Atlanta. I know we play this Jekyll and Hyde game all year with, with where is Tom Brady going to go with the football? I really thought Chris. I really thought he'd lock in on Chris Godwin this year. I, I was wrong. Post bye week, it seems like maybe he made a point to get Mike Evans the ball. Looking at the numbers from week 14 through week 16, Mike Evans had five targets week 14. Antonio Brown had five targets week 14. Week 15, Mike Evans had seven. Antonio Brown had seven. Sunday, Mike Evans doubled it. He had 12 and Brown had six. And you're saying, okay, it might be one game, might be a matchup thing. But when you go over, and I'm using our Roto Grinders premium usage tool app, which is awesome, by the way. But if you go over to look at their air yard market share, a little bit of a different story here. Week 14, Mike Evans, 26%, led the team. Antonio Brown, 6% on the same amount of targets. Week 15, 23% area market share for Mike Evans, 19 for Antonio Brown. Okay, it's closer. Last week, Mike Evans doubled him in targets. Antonio Brown still has six targets, though. Mike Evans had 39% of the market share, and Antonio Brown had five. So... I'm looking at that game and, and just looking at these numbers, and it seems like Mike Evans, to me, is is probably the guy. I mean, obviously, the ball can go to anybody. We saw Gronk made a highlight primetime uh, Gronk-esque whatever touchdown catch that stole the show, but he only had two targets. Gronk had two targets on Sunday. That's it. Good to see him doing his thing again, though. But that game could be sneaky. And that kind of ties into a little bit of a review here because the big shootout chalk potential, you're telling me Kansas City couldn't score in Atlanta and vice versa. Atlanta couldn't even score in Kansas City. But the Chiefs couldn't score on Atlanta. And I've been saying it all year. Yeah, we've seen some teams really smash another team, really take it to them a couple weeks here. But there's just no alpha team in the league. It is seriously any given Sunday. The Jets in one of the biggest underdog upsets in the last up decade against the Rams a couple weeks ago. There are no locks. There are no locks. And that Atlanta Kansas City game, a lot of cash plays in that one, right? Calvin Ridley. Calvin Ridley was still fine at the end. Need a little bit of comeback there. Um, but I, I was disappointed in the Chiefs' output, and I'm sure annual league wise as well it probably killed a lot of owners in that one too so that was a big surprise but really nothing surprises me anymore we've seen everything this year tj so you can really get creative and this is a prime opportunity to leave some money on the table week 17 i think just kind of going off on a little bit of a tangent there but that atlanta tampa game i think should be a decent spot agreed yeah and i I could not agree more really is a 
I know it's cliche, but it's a any given Sunday kind of league right now. Got the Jets winning, winning two in a row. You've got the Chiefs barely being able to beat the Falcons. So I, I, I agree. It, a lot of randomness in, in football right now. And it should make for, for fun playoff games, though, because I don't think it's super clear, like, oh, the, it's going to be these two teams at the end. I think that once the dust settles and we have our 14 teams, that anyone's going to be able to beat any of the remaining teams. And it should, should make for some exciting games and some exciting playoff DFS slates down the stretch couldn't agree more uh, yeah anything else you want to touch on for, on the nfc side of things i uh, um, i think we, we mentioned again we mentioned all the teams that still have something to play for so any of the teams in the nfc outside of those nine do, do uh, not technically have anything to play for there's one here do you- you mentioned Minnesota and Detroit pre-show. They have a decent total in that game. They do, yeah. So that's a game where it doesn't matter for either of the teams, but they do still have a 54 and a half total. So I my assumption is that total thinks that they're going to to play all of their players still, but we'll want to to keep an eye on that. I think especially with someone like Dalvin Cook. Yeah, it just it it, it gets a little risky, I, I would say, right? Even if it sounds like Dalvin Cook is a full go, it's it's hard to pay 9200 for someone that even if there's a small percentage chance that, you know, they rest them up or save them for next year or whatever. But great spot. We've been, we've been targeting running backs against Detroit all year long. So I think that – but may, maybe that game goes a little bit overlooked then I, I don't know how much people are going to focus on on the games where these teams have something to play for my assumption is that that's going to be the the primary talking point across the industry on on all the podcasts and articles and such so yeah that's a lot there 54 and a half is a, is a big total and you know we know we know we know that it's Dalvin Cook and Thielen and Jefferson and Marvin Jones on the Detroit side so we got some options there in that game and I'm sure some things will pop up, you know, unless you hardcore research it yourself, which I'm sure you can find some tidbits here or there. But another thing you'll see and, and will be discussed is contract incentives, right? A lot of these guys in this league have to be close to a lot of bonuses. And it kind of first came in my mind. I was thinking about week 17 when Mariota came in for the Raiders. He had all those crazy in-game incentives. Like if he had a win, it was X amount of more money for him and, and a whole bunch of other things. So I'm sure throughout the week we'll hear, oh, you know, Joe Smith needs 150 more yards to get that bonus. Like he wants to get it probably kind of thing. Or maybe the maybe the team will just screw him over and sit him. <laughs> Who knows? Like there's so much behind, you know, behind closed door stuff that we don't really know. But it just adds another element because you will for sure see some of that uh, circulate as people are making decisions on, on who to play in their lineups. And looking at the end, TJ, by the way, speaking of a lot going on, a little bit more of a, of a mess over in the AFC. Yeah. Looks like there's eight teams for seven spots. So you, you phrased it well. There's going to be an odd man out, potentially a playoff deserving team is not going to get in Kansas city clinched number one seed. So there's definitely some rest candidates there. I mean, they slept through the Atlanta game. Might as well sleep through another one. Uh, Pittsburgh and Buffalo both clinched their divisions, but there is some jockeying for position and Buffalo plays New England after our recording tonight. Uh, That two seed, I think is still kind of uh, up for grabs. But then you have the real fun. Tennessee, Miami, Baltimore, Cleveland, and the Colts are all 10-5 and five, trying to take four spots in the postseason. So there, there's a lot to sift through there and digest. And I don't know where you want to start, but I do want to say that I saw Warren Sharp post on Twitter. Warren Sharp's the man, by the way. I love his stuff. I don't buy a lot of books, but I do buy his – uh, fantasy analytical preview pretty much annually. So um, good stuff there. It's just really good advanced perspective of uh, the X's and O's and why teams do what they do and why they don't 
and sometimes why they should be doing more of what Warren Sharp suggests. Anyway, it, it, he retweeted something um, from from one of these shows. I don't know what it was, but apparently the Colts were calling out the Pittsburgh's plays in the first half of the game on Sunday because it was so predictable or they saw it on film. And allegedly in the second half, Ben Roethlisberger was just pulling stuff out of his back pocket that they might have not even practiced this week, but they used in the past. And you saw the difference in what the Steelers were able to do. And Ben still didn't look good by any means at all, but they were able to move the ball a little bit. We saw a little bit of life. We saw Deontay Johnson, you know, we saw some life there. So I thought Pittsburgh would be interesting to talk about for sure. Yeah, Deontay Johnson is someone that that I've been trying to target all year, I would say. Um he he just gets so many targets whenever whenever he's healthy. Another 14 targets this past week. So that's now I know this because I, I wrote him up in my GPP article last week. So in his last what? I don't even know. Seven games where I'll, I'll rattle off all the games where he's finished the game. Targets 14, 13, 12, 13, 16, 11, 10, 15. My goodness, what, what, what more could you ask for from a volume perspective? So I think Deontay Johnson is, is the number one guy that I'm looking for there. Now, granted, he doesn't, he's more, certainly more of a low A dot guy, but just such a high floor with that volume and especially on a full PPR site like DraftKings just adds up to, to a really solid projected fantasy output for Deontay Johnson. So uh, I definitely like him. As we said, the the Steelers are going to be competing for that, that number two seed, which would give them the, the right to play at home all the way to the point where, if they would eventually meet the Chiefs. So definitely something to play for there. And are they going to match up with Cleveland? I'm saying? Yes. Cleveland seven. Wait, so is Pittsburgh not going to be play- – <laughs> sorry, I'm just seeing this now. Cleveland's seven-point favorites over Pittsburgh. Why would they be seven-point favorites? That makes no sense. So maybe Pittsburgh's not going to be playing everyone. See, we're, we're – Sorry to everyone, but we're, we're trying to digest things uh, the same way you are here. You're getting a little bit of an of a on-the-fly view. But my gut would be that if Pittsburgh is a seven-point underdog to Cleveland, that maybe we're not expecting a full, a full repertoire. Would that be your read as well? Uh, yeah, yeah. See. for sure. That, that's, that's totally too big of a spread. Yeah. So that's interesting. And obviously huge game for the Browns too. I don't know, man. I, I want that two seed. Like we saw yeah. we saw Lambo Sunday night, but kind of like maybe a one B on a really bad weather day. Is, I, I don't I wouldn't want to go up to Buffalo for anything if I'm any other team either. <laughs> right? Like I don't want to go up to Buffalo. Which is actually interesting because a bad weather game would probably be bad for Buffalo. They are another team with no run game at all whatsoever. They don't try to run. They don't run. They can't run. So it's kind of interesting how, how it might work out. Speaking of, do you have a, well, is there any early bill spread without seeing tonight's outcome against New England? What do we have for them? I am seeing the Bills as a two-and-a-half-point favorite over the Dolphins. I mean – but I'm also seeing that they opened at five and a half, as five and a half point favorites, and it got bet down to two and a half. Oh wow! Well, that's and it's a forty-four and a half point total, which is a pretty low total for a Bills game, for sure. For a Bills game, yeah, with a high-powered offense like that, keep an eye, keep an eye on that. Those are maybe exactly. now two fringe games where, yeah, waiting on news. And there must be something about whatever happens tonight in this. Bills New England game must have an impact that at least that I haven't seen as I was doing my research. So apologies for that, but yeah, let, let's, you know, we'll, we'll know more after the Bills Patriots game tonight, but it is looking like we may want to to tread lightly with the Steelers and the Bills just based off what we're seeing in these Vegas totals. Yes, yeah, a big swing. Three and a half points or whatever it was. Yep. Good call there. 
But there are. Let's uh, talk about your Titans. We know that we know that they do need to win, and they have the highest total of the week, fifty-six total at Houston. The Texans are seven and a half point favorites. So Houston does not have anything that they are playing for, but but the Titans, your Titans, certainly do, and I think are, are going to be in need of a, of a good showing after a not-so-great one last night against the Packers. Yeah, pr- pretty poor showing. The defense looked as bad as they did all year. Uh, some big plays early, though, that kind of swung that game. Rashawn Evans, they first a three and out early in the game, and Rashawn Evans with a dumb penalty. And then, obviously, the Josh Kalou, was he offsides? Was he not offsides? Didn't look like he was offsides in the block kick. And then, of course, you know, you had Aaron Jones stepping out of bounds and didn't get challenged. So you just can't give Green Bay all of those extra looks at home in the snow, right? It's just a death sentence. And, you know, you take Henry out of the game a little bit, a little bit more. I mean, he still ran the ball a lot, but I think they were just trying to save face a little bit there towards the end. So I'm willing to throw it out. It was a little bit fluky, but once again, you know, Titans have, what, 13 sacks in 15 games now? Javon Clowney on IR, flop. Vic Beasley got cut two months ago. So all these high upside signings that Tennessee had and not having Dean Pease is a huge, a huge loss to them. You look at it on paper, you have Desmond King, Malcolm Butler, Adore Jackson, Kevin Byard, and Kenny Vaccaro in that secondary, which is really good, man. Those are good players. The same defense that, that helped them play ground and pound last year. So the Titans in the playoffs and win these gritty games. So it's really weird to me that we have this run-oriented uh, play-action pass offense that needs to outscore everybody to win football games. I mean, Tannehill could drop back and throw, but that's not when he's at his best. So it's just a bizarre thing where you need to get Henry as touches, but yet you have A.J. Brown and Corey Davis and John and Smith. So, I, I'll, okay, the Titans can win the division with a win or a Colts loss. So both games are at 4 o'clock on Sunday, which is cool. It's great for the sweat. Derrick Henry – needs 200 plus for 2000 yards <laughs> and it's kind of funny to say I think he could actually probably do it he's one of the, probably the only player in the league other than maybe Dalvin Cook that I'm like yeah he can run for 200 yards if he gets 30 carries so I want to see some ownership projections because we have so many players and we have Montgomery at a nice price a couple of studs I think the real leverage here is Corey Davis coming off a complete donut a complete donut and maybe more than ever Houston's going to be playing the, to stop Derrick Henry, if you can, on Sunday. They know he wants the record. They know that's their game. But Corey Davis here, on this slate, will probably be, I don't know, 6 or 7% maybe on, on, on something like this. So that's what I'm looking at. Obviously, you know, Tannehill makes for great GPPs. If you play multi-lineups and you know Henry's going to be mega-owned, sometimes you want to cover yourself and play a Henry team and then play a Tannehill team because we saw last night Tannehill gets it done with his legs too. So I think there is very high GPP upside in this game. And the big note is whether or not Deshaun Watson is going to play on the other side of things here. So that is obviously huge. And as bad as the Titans' defense has been, they're obviously going to be in play then if he sits, I think. Yep. So I'm looking now. It says that Watson, at least he's saying he expects to play in week 17. So let's hope that that's the case because if he does play, I I do think that this is the premier game to target on the slate. Obviously, we've got Derrick Henry. Take a look. Houston has given up the second most – yards rushing yards in the league to opposing running backs 151.7 yards per game on the ground so that sets up very very nicely for for our friend Derek Henry and really this, this is two teams that I feel like have won a lot of people a lot of GPPs over the course of this season in Tennessee and Houston because for some reason Tannehill and Deshaun Watson are just never quite owned as much as they should be and their passing pass catching options just never quite seem to be owned so I I think that you can like I love the Corey Davis call you can go Tannehill Corey Davis 
you can go to Sean Watson, Brandon Cooks. Cooks had a breakout game last week or this week, put up 30 DK points on, on 10 targets, got over 100 yards, got in the end zone. So I like Watson Cook stacks. We already talked about Henry. I'm curious to see how things are going to end up shaking out between Henry and Kamara at basically the same exact price, both in nice matchups where their teams need to win. So I, I don't know who is going to, to end up being the, uh, the more popular play of those two. Maybe people lean Kamara on DraftKings just because of the pass catching ability. And if that's the case, then Derrick Henry's a, a fantastic pivot, although I don't think there's any way we're getting him at, at super low ownership in this matchup. So, yeah, love the Titans. Uh, love the, the, the Texans' options on the runbacks, whether it's – and David Johnson has been, been coming on strong two weeks in a row now. So I think that, that he might be even be in play here a little bit as well. This is maybe one of the best four and eleven teams we've ever seen. People are gonna thinking the Titans are just gonna roll in there because they have to win and wash them is not gonna be the case. Five of their last seven games have been one score games the Texans have played in. In the beginning of the year, they had this gauntlet schedule. Oh, you know, 0 and four or whatever they were. Well, they started off at Kansas City, at home at Baltimore, at Pittsburgh, and then they they played Minnesota. They lost to Minnesota. It was respectable. And then the, t- the game they played against Tennessee earlier this year was gave me three heart attacks. 42-36, Tennessee won in the last seconds. That was that crazy A.J. Brown catch with no time left. And uh, this is going to be a game. And I-, I-, I wish it wasn't going to be. But even without Wolf Fuller, and I know Houston's bad defensively, we can't – Tennessee's just not going to wake up uh, unless they're saving something for the playoffs or whatever defensively. They're a team with very good talent on paper, but schematically, it's complete dog shit. And trust me, I, I, wa- I watch way too much Titans football. It's dog shit without DMPs. So, I, I think you're right. This is going to be a premier game. I, I would not mind building a couple of lineups and trying to figure out what pieces belong where. And uh, I, I like I like your call. Brandon Cook's big game, and... David Johnson finally, finally looking good. So this this is going to be a, a shootout, I'm thinking, and uh, I think Vegas is right. So anything else, or you want to move on? We got a couple more games in the AFC that are big time. No, I think we're good on that game. Is there one you want to touch on next in particular? No, I mean they're all pretty important. You know, we talked about the Bills. We're going to play the Dolphins and you know, keep an eye on the Bills. But the Dolphins need to win. There's no if and buts about it. Um, so I don't, I don't know where I'm really interested in, in Miami. I don't play a lot of Dolphins. And I don't think many people do. Miles Gaskin has been popular every other week. You know, he had a huge game against the Raiders. Two, t- two receiving touchdowns, 33 DK points. He's been very consistent. I mean, now his price is 6500 so I'm definitely much less interested on a slate where I could probably pay up for any of the other guys we just talked about. So, do you have any, you know, my, any mild interest in anybody on Miami's side of the ball here, TJ? I'm with you there. I, I'm just not as interested in Miami when, when they have Tua at quarterback. When it was, when it was Fitzpatrick, I was all about getting – getting Fitzy in there, getting Devontae Parker in there, but just just a different offense under Tua. And I, th- I think you're right with the Gaskin call. He's, he's probably the most playable Dolphin that I would look to on this slate. But again, with so many of these other running back options that, that we've talked about, he, he's not at the top of my list, but I have to think that, that he's going to come in with very minimal ownership and – he does have have that kind of upside and does have a, a pretty solid workhorse type of role. Let's see, yeah, last week fourteen carries, five targets. That, that's a pretty nice role there. So you can you can look to Gaskin, but not not my favorite team to to target Miami. Uh, yeah, we'll move on. We'll keep that quick. Don't need. Yeah, a lot. I, I think. Well, I think an, an, another 
running back option here that has been quietly very, very strong the last few weeks, but never seems to get a ton of attention. We, we've got the Colts hosting Jacksonville. Yep. 14 point favorites and Jonathan Taylor has been been pretty solid for the past couple of weeks here and as we know Jacksonville's right up there if not the the number one team that that we like to target with running backs they're yeah they're, they're third worst in the league in terms of of giving up yards to running backs 145 yards per game so this could be a, a good spot for Jonathan Taylor now his price is up there at 7400 and and maybe that's why he doesn't get a ton of attention but if he's going he, he could be a low owned pivot and unless, unless he gains steam as chalk just because the matchup is so good but I, I I haven't been I feel like I haven't been playing Jonathan Taylor enough or or even really at all but this feels to me like a spot where we should be looking his direction at least considering him in tournaments I love it I love that call. I think he's going to have a huge week. I think the Colts are going to roll. The pressure is going to be on Tennessee to get it done. I love the Taylor call. I mean, Jacksonville already locked up Lawrence, right? So, who cares? They're locked in. They, they the Jets won. really blew it. <laughs> yeah, unbelievable. So, I'm with you there. Good call there. You know, we saw a little bit of resurgence from T.Y. Hilton really in the second half of the season. I mean, he never really dudded since that big week third, or uh, excuse me, the uh, week 12 game against the Titans. 18, 28, 25, 11, 9. Last two weeks, okay. But he's still seeing about the same amount of volume that he has been seeing um, in a plus matchup. So, like, T.Y. Hilton's another one of those guys will be, like, 5%, but, like, can win you a GPP, especially in the matchup. We don't love the vo- volume, but – you know, Michael Pittman was a thing for a week, and I'm sure we both wish it was a little bit longer. Um, but he's in concussion protocol now, too. So this is maybe a quiet, sneaky, you know, one-off option maybe here or there, last piece in kind of guy. Um, I think Zach Pascal caught a touchdown, too. But I think they lean on Taylor. You know, he has no tread on those tires. He was rarely used at the beginning of the season. Now he's the guy, and it's fun to watch. So I'm with you there. Yeah, they really do spread the ball out through the air. So, so I, I think, like I said, Taylor's my my primary look here. And on the other side, I don't mind Chenault as well. He's been been like not great, but last couple games, seven, six, eleven targets, gotten into the end zone. Two of his last four games, 4,200. So his price came up a little bit. But if you want to, to work any kind of correlation in on the Jaguar side, which you certainly do not have to, it, it's it's always fine to not play any Jaguars. But if I was going to play someone from there, I think that, that Chenault is a fine play. And you can pair him with Taylor and hope for that game script where, where Indy's up, working a lead, running the ball. Jacksonville's playing from behind and throwing a lot, and, and Chenault seems to be the, their target leader and just probably the most talented guy as well. How about your guy, Dare Ugambale? 14 carries for 71, five targets. I'm kind of Oh, just, baby. I just wanted to see if I could pronounce that. Where's he at? Shot. He's 4,500. I'm, 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 I'm kind of joking, but if he's in the Millie lineup, then now that I like spoke into existence, I might as well throw him in somewhere <laughs> negatively I just remember cool. drafting him in best ball a couple times and then he just like never ended up playing he was so supposed to that's be, he was supposed to be Tampa Bay's Keyshawn Vaughn and now Keyshawn Vaughn isn't Tampa Bay's Keyshawn Vaughn right, right? yeah <laughs> so I mean he's a guy who, who can supposedly catch the ball I'm kind of kidding but maybe like a little bit not so don't don't take that as real advice but Hey, I mean, he got the work, and, you know, he can cash those passes. Daru Gimbala, I'm just proud of myself for pronouncing that. Twice That's impressive. Hey, man, you know. I You're a professional. Like, True professional. I can only do so much. Another AFC team I want to jump to. I'm going to give you two stats that I really like. My favorite stat of the year, maybe, is that Des Bryant has two catches in each of the last two games for two touchdowns, throwing up the X, baby. You'll love to see it. But what if I told you? that Mark Andrews in his career has never seen a game with double-digit targets. And he saw 11 last week when push came to shove, Lamar was thrown to his guy, career high in targets, never saw more than nine, I believe, 
got 11 against the Giants. The Ravens need to continue the streak to get in. So initially I'm thinking, I don't mind playing Lamar naked this week. You know, a lot of people do that. But with how crazy this week is going to be, I think you need as much upside as possible. I kind of am like warming up to maybe pairing Lamar with Mark Andrews now that I'm kind of looking at things. Lamar just is the Bengal slayer. He's the Bengal slayer. So, man, I, I'm kind of I'm kind of liking the Lamar Mark Andrews hookup here for GPPs, and I'm kind of looking at this game now. Do you have any thoughts on this game? I like that. I like that. I I think I'm kind of over the the Hollywood Brown thing. He just he's like okay, he scored another touchdown, but I I'm with you. I, I prefer for prefer Andrews. Eleven targets is I want to say more than more than we've ever seen Lamar lock in on on anyone for so I like that sign and I, I like T Higgins on the other side too yeah. it's always it's always a little bit tough playing somebody against Baltimore but Higgins has been the guy if, if, if there is a guy he can be the guy in Cincinnati and so yeah I think a, a Lamar Mark Andrews T Higgins game stack is is a nice call and probably won't garner a ton of ownership. I was seeing Lamar at like 5% in a lot of tournaments last week. Wow. And uh, maybe, maybe that changes now that you know, if Mahomes is not playing at all or not playing a full complement, maybe more people do gravitate towards Lamar, but he just hasn't been, been getting as much traction this, this year. So if, if we can get another low owned Lamar and pair him up with Andrews, I think that's a great call. Yeah, that that's kind of what I'm thinking right now. On Monday, you know, so much is going to change by Sunday. So we'll see. It, it should be fun. You know, typically we end our show with talking about how ugly tight end is and gun to head, you know, pick one to play. But we are loaded this week. Might as well end the season with a bang. I'm not ready to end the show yet, but I just scrolled over tight end, TJ. Who knows what Kelsey's going to do, right? Is he going to play? Is he not going to play? Um, my guess is probably not, but hypothetically, he's on the slate. Darren Waller, George Kittle came back. We got Mark Andrews we just talked about. By the way, Kittle had 92 yards in his first game back in two months. Mm-hmm. Tanya's on the slate. Jared Cook in a game that they need. TJ Hawkinson, 4,600 in a high total. Gronk in his minuscule target share, but serious upside and a nice matchup. Uh, Noah Font, I'm like addicted to playing Noah Font. I don't know why I get suckered into him all the time. I think the guy has serious upside. He always seems to get hurt. But but here we are. And the list goes on. There's even many guys under 4K here I'm looking at that are in play. Man, what do you think about tight end at first look? What do you, other than Mark Andrews, have any, any uh, input here on tight ends? Because there's a lot to pick from this week. I did the NFL um, – Crunch Time Live, and there was a lot of questions about tight ends. A lot of people were going double flex last week. They wanted to play Kelsey, who underperformed, and I totally get the play. Um, And I think a lot of people were talking about Austin Hooper and the Browns. um, You know, you look at the score and you're like, wow. But Austin Hooper got 15 targets while the rest of his team had COVID. And he only had 14 DK points, but I mean, God, the volume was there. I mean, that was it for the Browns. That's, that's pretty crazy. Actually. Did he have 15 targets all year, man? Yeah, that is pretty wild. Yeah. Well, we certainly have no lack of options at tight end this week, just with, with so many games, like you said, Kelsey, don't, don't think we're going to want to pay up for Kelsey this week just because, we, we don't know how much he's going to play. Hawkinson, I think, sticks out at 4600 Feels like a nice price for him. Fant, Fant's a good call. He, 9 and 11 targets the last, the last two weeks and has, has turned them into some you know, 260-plus yard games, which doesn't sound like much, but at tight end these days, that, that gets the job done. So I do like Fant. I think, I think you could, could look to Janu particularly if you're running Tannehill stacks or, or running game stacks. We, we talked about that game, like that game. 
Evan Ingram, if he's healthy, is interesting to me at 3,700. That's that's just so cheap for Evan Ingram. I know he hasn't had a very good season overall, but I like that price. And man, what a what a fail this this Parham. Hopefully, I'm saying that correctly. Chalk was. I know everyone was was so excited about him, the the XFL superstar, but he he, he didn't do much of anything yesterday. I, I played him in cash just because he was he was so cheap, but. Uh, I don't know if Hunter Henry is going to be back. Probably, I guess. Speaking of Austin Hooper and tight ends, the Browns are the other AFC team. We didn't spend a lot of time on. We talked about the weird spread with Pittsburgh, and we're not – we don't have any news publicly yet, but have to keep an eye on it. But the Browns are (laughs) – you know, they win and they're in. They clinch a wild card berth with a win. But they are big Texans fans because all three of their uh, scenarios, if the Steelers win, involve the Titans losing because, the, uh, uh, because yeah, they'll get the, the advantage there. So they need help. But if they win, they get in, they get it done. We'll see who gets off the COVID list. So, you know, people think, oh, well, who's sitting? Well, it works on both sides of the ball too. So we have to pay attention to what defensive players on these teams are resting too, because I was just thinking that because if Pittsburgh is sitting guys, then I, I love like a Baker Baker's only 5,500. Some know? massive ceiling games. Yeah. Baker Jarvis. Yeah. I, something has to be going on in Pittsburgh. I, I don't know why else they would be seven point underdogs. So right. Cleveland. I, I like that, that call. Yeah. Baker stacks, Chubb. Uh, I love that. I actually, yeah. for GBPs, people are like, well, Pittsburgh, like, not going to target anybody against them. I mean, Nick Chubb rebound. It was Nick Chubb's birthday, and he sucked. That was disappointing. <laughs> birthday narratives, man. So I like the bounce back there, too. If they're going to sit that front seven, <sighs> sign me up. The birthday bounce back narrative. The birthday I like it. Um, <laughs> I'm actually going to look up birthday narratives while I ask you about any other um, – anything else in these meaningful AFC games you have any notes on or impressions of? Let's see. I think we touched on the majority of it. We, we didn't talk about – let's see. I'm just going to go th- – we didn't talk about the Jets and the Patriots, and I don't think we need to. There's not going to be much in that game. Uh We didn't talk much about the Chiefs and the Chargers. Again, the Chiefs are going to be likely sitting there – all their guys, the Chargers don't have much to play for, but maybe like an Austin Eckler is still in play. Uh, Denver and Las Vegas, another game that does not matter, but has a 51-point total. So to me, that's that's one of those games where scoring's got to come from somewhere. And while there's not anyone that we tend to – to love from either of those teams. We, we did talk about someone like Fant. You've obviously got Darren Waller, so can look through some guys from, from that game as well. But for the most part, again, I'm going to be looking to, to focus my core game stacks around some of these games we talked about with the, the teams that have something to play for, and then we'll just look to balance that with whatever value may open up over the course of the week given teams that are, are sitting guys. And, and I'm, I'm sure that's some, like, min-priced, running backs and or wide receivers are going to become viable and we'll want to get those into our lineups. Just had some anxiety. Looked at my iPhone calendar to see what date for these birthday narratives. And it's going to be the new year when, when we see some NFL action on this Sunday, we're talking about this year was just a black hole. I, I don't know what happened since March, just the remote, you know, I don't know exactly what your work schedule is like, but, between everything going on and like I work remote 70% of the time. I just I don't know what day it is half the time. I wrote an article the other day for, for the newspaper I worked for and I, I wrote the wrong day and the whole time I was, I thought it was, I thought it was Monday and it was Tuesday and the whole article I kept writing Tuesday or uh, Monday or whatever it was. And I was like, wow, I really don't even know what's going on, but we're 2021 TJ. So happy early new year, my man. I, who knows what 2021 is going to bring, but hopefully some GPP takedowns for, 
for all of our listeners. And it's, it's been a wild season, man, for sure. Yes, sir. It really has. And yeah, I think, is there anything else you wanted to, to touch on? I think we've, we've kind of hit it all. Definitely stay tuned to, to all the content that we'll have coming out over the, the rest of the week at Roto Grinders. We'll keep, well, you know, a bunch of the other guys will be keeping you up to date on, on these team situations, injury situations, who's sitting, who's playing, all that good stuff. But hopefully we at least help to point you guys in the, in the right directions as we, we start to think about things and finish up this final week of the regular season. Yeah, it's Kadero Hodges' birthday for the Browns. So if he's healthy, there's your sub-1% birthday narrative. Where's Alan Lem when you need him? Play for Sunday. And also it's Dallas Goddard's birthday on Sunday. So they don't really have anything oh, to yeah. play for. Are the Eagles – or what's your gut? What are you hearing down there in Philly? Are we, who are we going to see? you have any idea at all? I think everyone should play. Well, we'll see Hurts again. So, that yeah, that'll be the, the, the Sunday night showdown with the yeah, Eagles and the, and the football team. But, yeah, Dallas got it birthday narrative for, for Sunday night. Actually, I, I I played a little bit of Goddard this past week. He didn't – obviously didn't do much of – didn't do much. But uh, – I like Goddard, and maybe maybe Hertz will look to feed him on his birthday. Yeah. That, I mean, you know these guys probably are not out partying, and they might not be hung over with all the restrictions and everything. I mean, who knows? James Harden's still flying around on his jet party in <laughs> Vegas before the NBA season. So, really, they're probably partying. <laughs> they probably are. They're probably partying. I, I see any of them out of the, at the uh, – the bar. Well, I guess I would have to go to the bars to see them. But if I do find anything, I'll, I'll let you know if I see Dallas out there celebrating the birthday. Yeah, go live on Periscope and be like, Dallas, <laughs> make sure you take your vitamin C before you go to bed tonight, buddy. Don't want you hung over for the game tomorrow. Put me in the Millie lineup. Oh, man. But, TJ, seriously, it's it's been a pleasure working with you this season. Looking forward to our future projects. And got anything – for the wrap up, any any final words on the 2020 NFL preview podcast? And once again, drop your Twitter handle for the followers. Sure thing. Yeah, it's sad that we're done, but it's been it's been a lot of fun doing this show with you. I've enjoyed it. Enjoyed getting to to know you both on air here, and you know, just chatting offline. I'm sure we'll, we'll keep in touch. And yeah, you guys can f- find me on Twitter again at TJL. 5124 DFS. Feel free to, to reach out with any questions or feedback or any of that good stuff. I'll have my, I guess, final GPP article as well out this week. And then we'll be picking things back up with PGA when when that restarts in two weeks. So I'll be, be back doing some PGA stuff, back doing a – Tambo and I did a – PGA lineup review show on Mondays that we stopped doing during NFL season, but we're going to pick that back up with the new PGA season. So looking forward to that one. I actually think that's a, that's a good show. You get just a, a little bit of a view into the the thought process of, of what we were thinking as we made our lineups, uh, what some of the other winning lineups did. It, it's more of a, I would say a DFS theory show. So it's obviously specific to PGA, but I think that a lot of the concepts can be applied across all sports. Awesome stuff, man. Looking forward to seeing your work in, in PGA. I know I'm, I do a couple of uh, lineup shows with Tambo here and there, so maybe our paths will cross on the links this season. But it's been a great year. Kind of started the show on the fly, figured some things out. But hopefully when you opened your app for the first time to try to look ahead, hopefully listening to this kind of got you on the right path and – got some different perspectives and ideas in your head. And I think that's part of the big thing in terms of research, you know, hear everyone, but don't always listen to everyone, right? Like if you're on a play, don't get off it, but there might be some things you just haven't thought about. There's a lot of smart people in this industry. A lot of people are smarter than me, but I feel like you have to just respect everybody's input because there's a million ways to like a guy, to play a guy or a million reasons to, to not play somebody and uh, you just have to you know, trust your research. And 
I, I'm a firm believer that the tools at Roto Grinders, especially the premium stuff that we offer, uh, will help you make money. It's that simple. You know, I love I love the team here. I've been with RG since June, and uh, I've learned quite a bit. You know, talking to uh, very, very skilled high stakes players like yourself. And so I want to thank you for, for all that you do and your perspectives. And uh, it's been a blast, man. So good luck this weekend in, in DFS, TJ. Thank you, my friend. And uh, bye, to, bye to everyone for now, but hopefully we'll be back in the future with, with some content for you guys. It's been, it's been a real good time. Really enjoyed it. Absolutely. Check me out on Twitter at the J Carlucci. Hit me up anytime. Whatever I can do to help, I will try to point you in the right direction. If it's Roto Grinders related, or you just want to pop in, and say hi, and and troll me when the Titans lose to the Texans this weekend. Feel free to to dish it out. So for TJ Lasig and the rest of the Roto Grinders team, I'm Justin Carlucci. Have a great, safe, happy New Year, and best of luck in 2021, everyone. <laughs>